Everyone is having a good day. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Max Ramirez. I have the privilege of being an MDC professor here where I teach digital marketing. And in addition to that, manage your BIT Center. And if you're asking, what does BIT stand for? It stands for Business Innovation and Technology. Long story short, uh, when our students graduate, my employers are gonna be asked three questions. And the first one's really easy. Do you have your degree? Check. And the questions get a little bit tougher. Do you have work experience in your field? And the last question, in addition to your degree, do you have industry certifications that prove that you're ready to work? So yes, I see you have a marketing degree, but are you Google certified? Do you have a Hootsie certificate? In the world of finance, great, you have your finance degree, but are you Bloomberg market certified? Have you ever been on a Bloomberg terminal? Do you have work experience in your field? So here at the BIT, free for our students, uh, we're waiving the fees for them to get industry certifications in their field, and we're creating organizations for them to get the hands-on experience. So two that I'll mention real quick. The first one, since I mentioned finance last, we created Smith Student Managed Investment Fund. Following all the protocols of an investment firm, our students are doing research on Bloomberg terminals, not monopoly money, real dollars investing. So you can imagine saying, yes, I've got my degree, I'm Bloomberg market certified, I've been on Bloomberg terminals, and I've been part of Smith. Boom, winner, 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 ding, ding, ding. In the world of marketing, we started student-operated digital agency. Uh, so you, same template, right? Hands-on, the industry certification. So now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mike McLone, but let me tell you a little bit about Mike McLone. I'll start off with his title first. He is a senior macro strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Nice, what does that mean? All right, it means he specializes in the broad investable commodity and crypto markets. I, yes, you know me, I'm a big fan of them. And, and he also authors the monthly Bloomberg Commodity Outlook and Bloomberg Crypto Outlook. Prior to joining Bloomberg, Mark was head of US research at ETF Securities. So, Mike, what did you do? You know, when you were our age, when you were a student, well, Mike has his MBA from DePaul University in Chicago and a Bachelor's of Science and Arts degree from Illinois State University. So Mike today is going to talk to us about the history of art. <laughs> or, or, or more likely, the art of making money. Mike, do you want to say hello? Well, I'm here mainly because of Max. Max invited me, was it 21? Yeah. For the first time. So thank you for that. And um, I appreciate you turn off the smile a little because it's distracting. I love that engagement so much. Just appreciate it. Much appreciated. Well, thank you, Robert, for having me here too. So um, there's a few things I appreciate more than coming to MDC. And you'll know from my accent a little bit, I'm from the South Side of Chicago. We don't say the Bears, we say the Bears. Um, and so I really feel similar upbringings with some of the people here who might not have born, been born where I raised a lot of my kids in wealthy Connecticut. Um, but um, so I'm at uh, Bloomberg um, and we had a few of the students come in the office the other day, really enjoyed that, we can do some more of that. And I'm going to show you my views, my outlook on the markets, the macro. And I warn you a little bit right now, it's not exciting. It's not, and I say it might be exciting, but it's not uplifting, um, but it's factual based on my views of the market. So. One thing about MDC is Max mentioned you can have access to the terminal anytime, Bloomberg terminal. Um, this is just a few things. I don't want to waste too much time on this. I write to these dashboards. I write to BI space COMD, that's commodity dashboard. And I write to this dashboard, BICRYP, that's a crypto dashboard. But I want to start out with um, some of the key things we're going to focus on today that a lot of strategists, economists, stuff you read, people you hear, miss. Like in 2008, this is stuff that people missed in 2008 that I was able to get right. It's never forget from where you came. That's why I started out with from where I came. Uh, big family, humble background, and I'm here presenting in front of you. So thank you for that. 
Um, I'm also point out to you, a lot of times facts are much more important than opinions. I'm gonna show you my opinions based on the facts. Um, and you can't alter the facts. Some people try to, but everything I show you has been published on the terminals data based on Bloomberg terminal. And that's the key thing about Bloomberg where the great data disseminator, disseminator in, in the financial markets globally. Um, and using the vernacular, I'm gonna show you a lot of stuff that has never happened before. I love that word stuff. By studying French, I should have studied Spanish. Remember my Spanish teacher loved, uh, French, French teacher loved the word stop in English because this is no equivalent in French. But I'm gonna start out with some things, stuff that never happened. Um, and um, a very unique situation, I think that's the foundation for my view, as you saw from the headline, I think we're heading towards the biggest re economic reset in a lifetime. Things you hear about like the Great Depression. You heard about, <clears throat> what, about the, great, the financial crisis. Um, from 2008 and nine. And it starts with the US stock market. So you take the US stock market divided by GDP, a relative to GDP. This is somewhat the Warren Buffett model. It, in 2022, 21, at the peak was the highest ever in the history of mankind. Now my chart goes back 60, 80, uh, what's one, about, about 70 years here. Um, but that's the key thing is don't forget from where you're from. So when you hear economists say, oh, we're gonna have a soft landing, oh, the stock market's gonna be okay. I'm like, that's okay when you have an environment when you're cheap or you're relatively priced right you're around here. But this is where we started when the Fed started tightening last year. The highest, most expensive market in the history of man. That's a problem. Next. So how is the U.S. stock market relative to the rest of the world? Most expensive ever, by far. And that's what I show you in this chart. In this chart, you show a U.S. stock market divided by, this is the S&P 500, divided by the MSC XUS, MSCI XUS. It's just an index that measures the rest of the world, not um, tracking the US. And this is a, a, in some insight I got from my colleague, Gina Martin-Adams, you've seen her on TV, you've seen her, if you have seen her, she's our equity strategist. That the point is, you've seen this chart, what happened? For a good 20, 30 years, market fluctuates, and all of a sudden, bam, it takes off. It got very expensive. US stock market just got too expensive relative to the rest of the world for good reasons, but a lot of that was because of the pump in liquidity. What I show you slightly here in that orange line, that's the stock market from 19, 1877 to 1931. It shows the big crash. The big crash, the biggest crash in history was when the stock market crashed in 1929. It went down 50%, it went up 50% in, 20, in 1930, and then the rest is history. It had the Great Depression. We're doing similar right now. So like I said, I'm not out to uplift you, I'm out to point out facts to where we are in the market and why I have my views that we're in the midst of the greatest economic reset of a lifetime. And also what I show you in here, some of that I should have mentioned earlier, these little red lines you see here, that's um, recessions in the US. And the little gray line here, that's just a probability that you get a recession from markets from the yield curve. I'll explain that a little bit. It's just an expectation of recession. So it's virtually guaranteed we're going to recession. David Altag, the uh, the uh, Atlantic Atlanta Fed governor, was spoke in the room over here last week. He said, we expect that. I'm like, okay, well, if you expect that, people tell me, oh, it's okay, stock market's already corrected. I said, well, good luck, because it's still probably about the most expensive ever worth versus GDP, versus the rest of the world, and versus housing. Housing market U.S. So here's another chart of the U.S. stock market relative to the U.S. housing prices. I use a number measure. This is um, the FH, FA housing index. So what happened in the last time? Remember these little red lines of recessions? Housing stock market gets very expensive. 2000 goes down. We have a recession. Bam, we go down. It gets really cheap. It goes back up. This is the problem again. When people talk to me about, oh, it's going to be a soft landing. Everything's going to be okay. I think never forget from where you came. This again is one of those things that's never happened. Stuff that's never happened before. In this chart, we never got that, that expensive ever versus the US housing market. So how's the US housing market doing? Well, this is a problem. What I show you in orange is uh, the US housing market. See how it's turning back down? See that little arrow there? I circled it. It's got, dropping at a higher velocity than it did in 2006, from 2006 to 2011. I bought a house and sold a house right here. So we're, we're dropping at a faster pace from the highest plateau ever. And what's most significant from this chart is what you see in white. Something again, two things. 
Don't forget from where you're from. It's something that's never happened before. That's money supply, US money supply. For a good reason, you saw the big spike in money supply that was up 26%. In the history of mankind, our data going back to the 50s, money supply has never spiked at the pace it did during the, uh, during the plague, the pandemic. Why? Because we did have to pump the money supply. It was a pretty severe situation. Remember, I like to defend the Fed a little bit. We had to pump the system with liquidity because it's never happened before and we didn't have vaccines. Now we do. And now the problem is it's dumping. The pace of money supply system is greatest in the end time ever. This is worse than the, the, uh, the Great Depression. I tried up recently some of Ben Bernanke's essays on the Great Depression and everything. His conclusion was declining money supply on a global basis. We're getting that now. So my foundation for what I explained to you, what I think is going to be the biggest reset of our lifetimes, is come on, came on the back of the history of pumps and dumps. They all come on the back of massive liquidity that dumps. We are in the middle of the biggest dump ever, just having biggest pump. So I'm going to show you part of that in this chart too. So um, mean reversion can be a powerful force, particularly when you go way too high. That's what I show you in that big, the big white line here. All that is, is a fact. It's a measure of um, housing prices on a year-over-year -year basis. They've never jumped at a faster pace on a year-over-year -year basis, ever. Now, that's just, I use two measures there because when I publish on the terminal, it's very much institutions, and they will rip into everything I say. I suspect this audience might be a little bit nicer, but I have to be defensive with my data. So I use two measures there. There's a little one in the, on the magenta behind it, but that's the problem. Don't forget from where you came. So housing jumped the most ever for good reason. We pumped the system with liquidity, and now it's plunging at about the greatest pace since the biggest the big housing collapse in 2006 and 2011. But what's significant here is I show you in orange. What's that in orange? That is um, one of the number one measures of the consumer price index. You've all heard of inflation's really high. We all feel inflation's really high. It's called owner's equivalent rent. You don't have to dig into it a, a little bit, but it's just a measure of rent based on the price of a house. It's significantly lagging. The Federal Reserve is still tightening based on significantly lagging measures. And as I showed you, all the forward-looking measures are collapsing. So they're behind again. Not so much their fault, it was just subject to the cycles in the market. So this is what I'm going to point out. A year from now, if I have the honor again presenting to you, I fully expect there are gonna be a significant deflationary period and we'll be in a pretty severe recession based on what I see here. Have you heard of producer price index? I mentioned this consumer price index, CPI, it's something that's more watched by the Federal Reserve. But the producer price index based mostly, it's, it's kind of like the high velocity version of the PPI. It basically has a two beta, it oftentimes moves about two times the CPI. It's dropping now at the greatest pace in history. Never happened before. That's another never happened before. Um, it's, um, there's only 75 years of data. <laughs> So I think that's pretty bearish. I mentioned that to David Altag, um, and we had a nice conversation last week. And his quote to me was, I had just published that day last week that I think the Fed's gone too far. And his quote was, I think that there's people at the Federal Reserve that agree with you. So this is part of what I'm pointing out. This is a good leading measure of inflation. It's collapsing, and there's good reason for it. The, the point is the Fed and the Federal Reserve is still tightening. I don't have to dig into this here in this chart, but typically in past history, when this leading inflation measure, or more, I would say, equal inflation measure, it's not lagging, was dropping this fast. The Federal Reserve is always easing or adding liquidity to prepare for that recession. They're still expected to hike rates next week. That's part of the problem. Lessons of Ben Bernanke, hiking rates, taking out liquidity into recession. So this is just another, I want to show you another measure on this. It's something that's never happened before, and that is the... Um, what I show you in orange, that's just a measure of, it's a relative measure of commodities going back in history. It's a measure of the Bloomberg commodity next versus a 60 month average. Why 60 month? Because that's five years, it's standard in commodities. And you can see there's a downward trajectory. Commodities got very expensive in 70, 74. I remember that one. The 79, I remember that one. I was pumping gas at a gas station about 16. And we had a we had a price start pricing gas in half in half gallons because the pumps, the analog pumps were not configured. No one even figured gas would go over a dollar again. Remember that one well? So we had a lower high here, now we know the lower high here. The point is commodities are collapsing, which you can see here. 
But what you see in white is what the Federal Reserve is doing. That's a logarithmic measure of the Fed funds rate. Logarithmic because it shows the more relative value. And you can see it's basically the sharpest increase ever for the Fed to take away liquidity from the system, yet commodity inflation are collapsing at the sharpest price ever. That's a recession waiting to happen. It's just a matter of time. Again, I'm a forward-looking analyst strategist. I don't sit on the Fed. I give advice, but that to me is what the risk is. And here's another thing that's never happened before. We've all heard about the NASDAQ stock index. Everybody's into tech, right? This is a tech center. NASDAQ is one of the best measures of tech centers. And another thing has never happened. The NASDAQ index, I show you in white, 100-week moving average is turned over. It's only happened twice in history that it started to turn over. And that's just a measure of 100 weeks. It's a good, slow, moving measure of where markets are going. As you see, I do a lot of stuff to try to measure markets, see where they're going, and anticipate they're going to continue going there. What's never happened in the past when this index has rolled over is the Federal Reserve to still be taking away that punch bowl. Have you heard that term before? When there's a party going, and the party gets too excessive, you got to take away that punch bowl. Some of the parents in this room get that. I yeah, see you smiling, yeah. sir. Yeah. I think they're waiting for so the kids can be there. That's right. <laughs> and having raised a lot of kids, I find them on the sofas in the morning and thank God they're safe. Uh, but what you see, and that's so the market's starting to roll over, just getting started. Yet the Federal Reserve is still taking away that punch bowl. That's never happened. The last two times we had a roll over in the markets, as you see here, roll over, Fed, this is the Fed funds rate. The Fed was easing aggressively, throwing money at the system to try to alleviate a recession, a depression. Same thing here. Back in 2008-9, the Great Recession, as people call it, market was rolling over and the Federal Reserve threw tons of money at it. I was there. I was a trader. They were making some good money in that. It's the opposite now. The market's rolling over and they're still taking away that punch. It's just to me, it's just the lessons of the Great Depression kicking in now. Um, key thing also, I like to point out, another thing that's never happened. We have 130 years data of crude oil. Everybody knows how expensive gasoline and crude oil got last year. On a two-year basis, it never rallied more than last year, ever, any time in history. So how do you measure that when you're a smart quant geek? There's no measure of it. There's no example. But typically, it's the, measure, it's the rules of mean reversion. So that's what I show you in white. Crude oil on a two-year two -year basis, 24 months, never got as expensive as it did last year, and it's collapsing. What it is, it's the most... The word I like to use is mean reversion. You probably heard the term autocorrelation. Autocorrelation is a, the fact of when something moves a lot, it's its own enemy. It makes it move the other way. Um, it's like markets go up too much, it makes them go back down because they're too expensive. So it's plunging at the moment right now compared to last year. At the same time, the stock market got very expensive. Why? Because we, I showed you earlier, we punched it with liquidity. Now everything's going away. The key question I like to ask myself and everybody, and I ask viewers and listeners and people on the terminals, what stops us? Yes, sir. Uh, I probably missed something at the beginning. I can't make it. I'm sorry. Stop it. I didn't even pump it. In 74, uh, that's when the embargo? Yeah. So that was the um, the war and the Arab oil embargo, um, OPEC oil embargo. Well, why is it that one uh, just like a straight line, the other one went up and then it went down? That's what happened back then. There were no liquid futures. Oh. The markets were not as liquid. Crude oil futures started trading in 1983. Oh. Oh. So markets were much more controlled. Yeah. Now it's one of the things that, you know, never, that's, they say the good old days, it's much more open free markets. So free markets are reigning much more now. That is collapsing the price of crude oil. And back then, who was the world's one of the largest largest importer crude oil on the planet? Was this country, US, now a net exporter. Why? How? Number one reason was rapidly advancing technology, adopting it and right. using it. So this is the same chart to show you lighter again. So I'm very bullish gold. I want to only show you a few things I'm bullish. I'm bearish crude oil. I'm bearish most risk assets. I feel a recession coming. And here's why I'm bullish gold. So what I show you in gold is the same measure of gold at a 24-month measure. So it just got a little cheap. We had a, we have a gold bull market that dipped, and it's going back up. We had a crude oil bear market that popped up, and it's going back down. So I like to publish, I published an article that crude oil, fossil fuel deflation is fueling gold inflation. And I fully expect that to continue. So um, we got that extreme high in crude oil. Again, that never happened, never got that expensive. Of course, we have, our data only goes back 123 years. Um, and it's going back the other way. So the key thing I'm bullish on is gold. And I like to point out 
versus the S&P 500. Have anybody here heard of the S&P 500 index? It's Standard Poor's 500 index is the number one measure, as soon as I know what to say, I'll get you, is number one measure of the stock market and risk assets on the planet. I used to work at S&P, and the way I used to say, when that move, index moves a lot, particularly if it drops, it's the most important thing in markets. So the Standard Poor's 500 index is right now is about 4,000. And gold is about 2,000. So what I show you in this chart is the price of the Standard Poor's 500 divided by gold. It's about 50%. Go back 100 years in this chart. It looks like it's just going to pack, pop up back up to par, one to one. So my expectation is it's probably going to meet about 3,000. I think gold's going to go to about 3,000. The Standard Poor's 500 is going to go about 3,000. That's a complete non-consensus view based on facts. Yes, sir, you had a question. S&P standard and four five one. Yeah, standard and four. Yes, sir. If you do this, so are you buy the mine or you buy the actual GLD for gold? So I don't give investment advice. So we could go there, but there's um, just let you know there's GL. There's number numerous ETFs. We can buy actual physical gold, okay. very fluid and easy. And then there you can buy the actual company. So historically, over time, the actual metal investment in metal like GLD outperforms the miners, and the reason is. It's harder and harder every day to create more gold. You can't rapidly technology will not bring on more of it. Um, and supply, so supply is very limited. And the biggest money ent entities on the planet are buying a lot of it. Guess what that is? That's all I needed to go. Central base. 184. What's that? That's the price of uh GMP. Yeah, so that yeah, is uh, there you go. So on to the next slide. Um, this is something I published um, at the end of the quarter, and it was something I enjoyed because a lot of people have been pooing gold forever. Gold has underperformed the stock market for 10 years for good reason. But at the end of the quarter, it's about 2000, it was the highest quarter in price for gold ever in history of mankind. Now, that's in terms of dollars. Last year, gold made new highs in the euro, in the yen, and a lot of other currencies. Typically, it's a sign this is going to be a matter of time in, in, uh, in US dollars. So what I also point out showing on the chart here is crude oil. Look at crude oil starting to head downward. Crude oil is the world's most significant commodity, but we can make more of it. We use less of it every day. The world's farmer, world's, world's largest former importer, the U.S., is now a net exporter. We're a competitor to OPEC now. So that deflation in fossil fuels is fueling that inflation in gold. And I think it's going to continue based and potentially accelerate based on the other things I showed you earlier. So this is part of um, a chart. Yes, sir, go ahead. <laughs> so I don't give investment advice. I'm bullish gold. I'm bearish crude oil, bearish stocks. I'm bullish gold. So um, the I think the key thing that's holding back gold has been what's been pressuring for the last 10 years, the U.S. stock market outperforming the world. I show you that chart. That's what I show you in white. And I show you in gold. There's almost a complete opposite correlation, inverse performance between the price of gold, which I show you in uh, gold, and the U.S. stock market rest versus the rest of the world. Why? Because when U.S. stock market's going up at a high pace, high velocity, why bother with boomer rocks? You guys know what boomer rocks are? That's what crypto people like to call gold, boomer rocks. So I like to put that in a headline. So um, I do expect this started ahead low, lower. The U.S. stock market looks like it's due for a good correction versus the rest of the world. That's not profound. It's just a simple correction. It looks like gold's ready to break out. Like I said, I think gold's going to 3,000. And the S&P 500, that's at 4,000, is going to go to 3,000. I think they're going to meet. That's the per ounce price of gold. Um, and I also want to point out something that's different, something that's never happened, something that's changed. This is what's changed in the world since the financial crisis. You can see that in the bottom here. This is the correlation between the price of crude oil and um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now I can I use the Dow Jones because I can go back 130 years on that. In the past, see how it was like no correlation is basically negatively correlated. This is how the world changed during the financial crisis. We punched so much liquidity in the system, we made all correlations kind of sticky together. So this is part of the reason I'm bearish crude oil. I'm bearish stocks. The correlation is the highest ever. Everything looks like it's going to be heading downward for just a little bit of reversion for a while. And what's the key reason for that to happen? The Federal Reserve is tightening and taking late liquidity. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, the, the back one, we only have, we only showed the uh, West Texas is remaining. And uh, what about the, uh, you know, the, 
the uh, rest of the world. So the world, the West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil is the world's benchmark for crude oil. The other one is Brent. Brent does, we don't have data on, on Brent going back 130 years. So um, I want to move on from the nickname I've earned is McLoon. And only because I point out facts, as I showed you, facts is what I'm worried about. And I look at it myself. If I see a hurricane coming, you know, I don't warn people, I would be remiss. So I see a hurricane coming, and I warn people about it based on the facts. But what I show you here, something that's also happening, you can see that in the white chart and in the orange, contracting. That is not only pulling out liquidity, that's money supply declining, but it's also bank credit. It's what you see in magenta here, that's commercial bank deposits are plunging. Basically, we're in the middle of a bank run. Money is leaving the banks for a good reason, because in a bank, a typical depositor is getting zero, maybe fraction percent, but money markets, treasury bond, treasury bills, Two-year notes, now you're getting four, four and a half, and up almost 5% in something. So money's clean. So what happens when you have a bank contraction, credit contraction? We're a credit-driven society. You get a recession, potentially very severe one. That's just getting started. The point is, again, this has never happened before in our data going back 50 years that we've contracted this much. The key question is, what stops it? Anybody have any ideas what might stop us? The Fed, the exactly. <laughs> and what's the Fed doing? Taking it out. Exactly. So, so <laughs> to me, this is a slow moving train wreck, and it's going to happen suddenly right now. It's gradual. It's gradually right now, but it's what happens. It's just oh, the way it is. If it, well, the benefit of time keeps everything from happening at once. So, what I want to show you here is the yield curve. The yield curve is a measure of the rate on, let's say, a 10 year note, is what I showed you here versus the rate on, say, a one-year note, one-year bill is what you call it. It's inverted right now. That rate for one year is because the Fed's raising rate is much higher than the rate 10 years out from now. That's what I show you here. But this is a global measure of the yield curve. Basically, what happens when the curve's inverted like this, meaning rates in the long term are much lower than rates in the front term, is when the Fed's intentionally trying to squash economic activity. My fear is they're going to squash it too much at a point time that's gonna really hurt hard. So what I show you is I'm, I'm, I'm transitioning over to cryptos because I'm showing Bitcoin is probably gonna have a problem in this environment. Now Bitcoin is hovering around 29,000. It's been doing very well. It's a unique asset. I think it's become a global digital collateral and the world going digital. But if the stock market goes down when I think, like I think it will, Bitcoin's probably gonna have a problem. So I wanna dig into cryptos a little bit because also here's the shorter term indications. Um, you've heard of Ethereum. Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two top cryptos. The reason I like to dig into those a little, because they're more the optimistic new technology like the center that's driving where everything is going. Why can I access the world on this phone in 10 years? I can go down, I can trade every currency, anything I want here. People in China can get access to our currency, any currency they want on their phones. They couldn't do that in the past. But Bitcoin and Ethereum are both at very good resistance around 30,000 for Bitcoin and Ethereum at 22,000. This is what a money manager or trader does. Okay, you have a macro view, you said my macro view, and then sometimes they have to use the more the micro charts and things to guide your pushing the button to make investment decisions. So I look at it as very good resistance at these levels. I'd like to see them break above, but for the meantime, it's kind of risky they're going to go lower. Um, but this is the key thing that happened since March. See that chart of Bitcoin in white overlaid with the bank index? And I pointed to how we're having a bank crisis a contraction of credit, banks are plunging. In orange, you see the KBW bank index collapsing, but Bitcoin rallied when that happened. That's a sign of divergent strength. That's a sign that this global digital collateral, that's one of the best performing assets in history, might finally be breaking away from being a very much risk on asset to being something that people want to hold for a risk off asset, like gold, bonds, treasuries. So that's a significant trend. It's showing the signs of that, of that inflection. It's just, I don't know how, how it's going to work out. It's usually not that easy. Um, the key thing I want to point about Bitcoin, because again, I want to positive, focus on some positive assets here, is people have heard how, you've heard how Bitcoin is too volatile. So when Bitcoin, volatility in Bitcoin is declining. But I want to show Bitcoin volatility relative to, say, in blue. That's an annual measure of volatility. Bitcoin's around 60 or so percent. In, I guess it's Aqua. That's Amazon. You guys remember Amazon? I remember in 2000, Lehman Brothers put out a report in 2000 that Amazon was going to go under and fail. Who went under? Exactly. <laughs> Lehman. So I just enjoy that. 
But here, what happened in Amazon? What's that trend? Volatility goes lower. NASA data, NASA technology, disruptive. Gage market share, like uh, Max Pont pointed out in some in his class recently, and boom, it goes down and becomes mainstream. So it's Bitcoin volatility now is much lower than where Amazon was in 2000. And it's not much different than where gold was in 1980. So I just love that analogy. Another key thing about Bitcoin is what you see in white that's unique for this risk asset is declining, definable declining supply. By code, you've heard of the halving. Anybody heard of the halving? Bitcoin next year, the cut the supply is going to be cut in half. But what I show you in white is by code, that supply is continuing to decline. Why does the price of crude oil never go up and stay up? And why do commodities never go up and stay up? Because price goes up and people bring out more supply. It's called elasticity of supply. There's no elasticity of supply. So this is why I look at Bitcoin in the long term, the price must go up over time. Just a question if it works out a lot or not. So I'm going to measure a little bit of, um, how many of you heard last year about the word commodity super cycle? And during inflation, the theme last year was we we're going to have inflation forever and the commodities are going to be the place to go. What's happening? Inflation is not dropping. You don't see it dropping yet. From my measure, so it collapsing. And commodities are collapsing. And people were pushing back in Bitcoin. But I'd like to show you here is in white, I show you just a chart of Bitcoin relative to the Bloomer Commodity Index. What does it do? Over time, it's been going up. Why should that stop? The significance is, I like to point out, is Bitcoin is becoming more and more in the mainstream every day. You can see that by its volatility. That's what I show you in, in white. The volatility of Bitcoin a few years ago was about 10 times the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Now it's only about three times the Bloomberg Commodity Index. It's going mainstream. So I looked at, like to look at it as you're supposed to buy dips and assets like that. Again, the same similar kind of thing. What I show you in, in that aqua line is the supply of Bitcoin declining by code. You can't do anything about that. But overlaid with that in orange is Crude oil and liquid fuel consumption in all of North America, means US and Canada, the consumption declining versus production. Our production is going up, our consumption is going down. What does that mean for price? Exactly. It's got to go down over time, unless something changes. So I don't see what's going to change it, but that's why I like to show again th this asset that when I first learned about it from my eldest son, who's about some of your ages, um, in 2010, called Silly Internet Money. Is just continuing to progress. Yes, sir. Um, you said that we're consuming less crude oil. I guess I don't really understand that. But I was the person consuming. Be careful of uh, people who have a vested interest yeah. in what they tell you to help sell products and things, and, and vested interest in um, the price going up. So this is North America, U.S. U.S. consumption of crude oil peaked, I think, was 2006 or seven, and it's been declining since. Yet our, our production is blasting up. What I show you here is U.S. and Canada. So why is it peak? And if you drive an electric car, I get an electric car. If you drive a vehicle or bike, electric yeah. bike, it's number one. It was efficiency back then. Now we're in the greatest stage ever of transitioning auto manufacturers from internal combustion to EVs. Now, that's just one part of the demand function, but it's also demographics, mostly efficiency and yeah. supply. You need, we, yeah. yeah, so there's another, other, many other uses, but the number one source of demand for liquid fuels is transportation. So that's just a fact of what's been happening. Key question I ask myself is why should this change? These are facts of trends. In North America. Now you see a pickup in China and Japan, but China's total sales of cars last year was 20% were EVs. 10 years ago, zero. Where's that next 10 years? Probably 60%. We are pulling away from internal combustions, and the internal combustion engines we are using get are so much more efficient. The way I, the quote I like to use is people are smart, commodities aren't. We, as a human race, create more and more commodities on a daily basis every day. We had a little bit of blip in the last few years, and we use less of it because we're not stupid. I mean, it's just, I, I come from a farm. Here's a good example. The average per acre in Illinois, which is where I'm from, right now produces double the amount of corn it did in 1973. Remember we saw that in 73 when it was that crisis? Double the amount from the same, about 180 bushels per acre back then, it was closer to 80 or 90. How did we do that? We use less fertilizer. Technology, 
so many different things. It's just a fact of what's happening that I like to point out when people call for inflation. I said, look for the opposite, deflation. There's this great book I read called The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth, pointing out the deflationary tendencies in technology. It's the price of tomorrow. I know Jeff, he's a friend. Bestseller list on lists in New York Times for well. Um, just a few more slides here, and then we can dig into some QA. Another thing about Ethereum, what is Ethereum making possible? One in Ando. I have a good friend of mine, ex Wall Street guy from Connecticut, um, used to work in New York. We did the commute. Now he works in Miami for his title as head of cryptos for LATAM. That position did not exist two years ago. Why does MasterCard and Visa care about Ethereum and cryptos? Because what this does, what this technology does, allows them to square their transactions instantly, much more fluently, efficiently than they could in the past using crypto dollars and other things. Um, but here's a key point I want to make out about Ethereum and Bitcoin, definable diminishing supply. Over time, as long as you're increasing the adoption, price must go up. Short term, it's a different story, but I want to kind of get point out the one thing I like about Ethereum and point out is, I, so I guess it's hard to see the top of that screen there. Does that go away? There we go, if I stop messing with it. Um, increasing adoption, um, crypto dollars. Have you heard of stable coins? But her stable coins. So what Ethereum makes possible is the most widely traded crypto is the US dollar. It's not Ethereum, it's not Bitcoin, it's tokens that track the dollar. Why? Because most of the people in the world have not been able to get access to the dollar. Most thing, certainly some I've learned in Miami from people in South America is you want access to a currency that's not melting, um, most notably in Asia. But this technology allows everybody in the world, particularly if their government doesn't allow them to, to get access to other assets through tokens, most notably the dollar. That's what Ethereum is making possible. So I just like to point out these trends and I wanna end with this one slide that one thing that's really happening in cryptos is just massive speculation that happens in all new technologies, all new revolutionary um, things like railroads and airplanes and electricity. Um, and what I show you in uh, orange is the number of cryptocurrencies listed in coinmarketcap.com. There's 23,000 of them. That's a lot. Maybe maybe a hundred matter. The Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index, which I helped launch, attracts 12. Um, but the key thing I want to show you from that to me is science of massive speculation. So people who trade these things, you have to be very careful to buy high, sell higher, and sell fast um, when they trade them. I don't trade. But what's significant from this is what I show you in white is a definable diminishing. Um, I, I'm sorry, definable bull market, and that is crypto dollars. The whole world, have you heard about the demise of the dollar, the de dollarization? I've heard this a lot. People are saying, oh, the dollar is getting pushed away, and no one wants it anymore on a global basis. In cryptos, it's the opposite. The most widely traded cryptos are the dollar. People want access to the dollar. they not being forced to do that. They did it organically. And that's what I show you in white. That's just a number of stable coins, crypto dollars that we have now. It's about 128 billion. The significance is just a few years ago, it was only two billion. Trends going up, Contrary, clearly increasing. With that, I'm not gonna make you read this, but I can go to any kind of Q's and A's and questions you want. You can go wherever you want. I think that's the quote of the day. I want access to money that's not melting. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something I really enjoy about uh, Miami. The quotes I like about Miami, it's close to America and they speak English. Um, but it's the, the access to like even my colleagues from Brazil in the office say, Mike, we, you know, we, we it's hard. We need to get stable assets that we can, and we know that the, the currency is not just melting. Um, now, the Brazilian real has been good the last few days, but the last 10 years, it's collapsed, maybe 50%. Yes, sir, please go. So you're saying that Ethereum helps uh, people from other markets uh, access our markets for the US dollar to uh, their big one, whatever you want to call it. I guess I'm just curious, like fundamentally, so say the dollars in Miami and somebody in like Sudan, the where, and I'm just, you know, I'm a little older, but I don't know, but I'm just, I feel like the dollars either here, like, you know, or it's, if it's on like somebody's log book in the bank. So my log book says now it's in Sudan, that you know, regulated bank, and now it's like theory, but they're not regulated. So I guess I'm just curious, like, then people start trading where, where does the dollar have to be? Maybe it doesn't matter where the dollar is, or I guess that's what I'm trying to. Crypto dollars, digital dollar, and it's not physical dollar. No, no, I understand. But... Yeah. So the key thing I point is, so Ethereum is the technology that makes the tokenization. So the question was about the dollar. For those of us who might, I don't know if you can hear it, the question. 
um, it, it makes possible the tokenization of all assets. Well, you can track an asset through a, a digital token and track it on your phone through a centralized location, but it doesn't really have, it might, where those actual dollars sit is virtual, but they do have assets to back them up. Now we had a problem recently with Terra Luna, what was an algorithmic dollar that failed, that was really virtual, that failed. But these entities that offer, the number one is Tether. The number one crypto dollar is Tether. I, I can show you that in a second. Um, as soon as I find my browser here. Um, there we go. And it has basically states, at least has been audited, that it, it has physical assets that, that back up those dollars. So where they actually sit, the physical assets, it doesn't matter. It's a token that matters. That token trades anywhere, everywhere on the, on the planet. So the person is then, whatever, for some reason, they just can't get, say, like, uh, Wells Fargo's dollar. So they use Ethereum to track that dollar that Wells Fargo has, basically. The, well, it's not so much who has it. It's... It's, I guess I'm just, I guess I'm just you know, like correctly tracking it, I guess, and making sure that this accounts for this. Because I was just having the impression that, like, say, Wells Fargo doesn't necessarily align with all these different cryptocurrencies. And so I guess in my mind, I'm like, how can they really track it? They're not really speaking the same language. That, that, that's what I'm kind of wondering. You know. It's access to that asset, access to um, the ledger that tracks the dollar. And actually, where those dollars are held, are typically like their circle is another token that tracks the dollars. They list every day, they show the actual assets that hold those dollars. But the person's trading those dollars doesn't care. They're just getting that dollar exposure. So for instance, let's say you have China Yuan and you want to convert that to dollar. That's a common thing that's happening. That's a country where there's a major flight and people want to get access to the dollar because the government doesn't let them. So they try to. I'll show you this for a second. So they can do it via a token that tracks the dollar on their phone. That's all they really care about. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna just bring this over in a second. And I wanna show you something I, I've shown here before that I know that you can see that now. This is a standard page that a lot of people watch in crypto. So this. CoinMarketCap.com. It's just a measure of all the cryptos, the main cryptos. See this number? Up on, uh, up on the left, this is a total amount of cryptos that this are listed now. 23, if I can get my mouse over there. 23,000. But this is just measured the market cap of, cap of crypto. So see what's on the top? Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tether, BNB. So it's all by market cap. So if you sort by volume, this is a simple electrical exercise I like to show everybody. What's the number one in trading crypto on the planet? Tether. It's controversial, but what is it? So it's a dollar token. See that one there? It's all this, one dollar. So it's the most widely traded crypto almost always. And where it trades is subjective. It's probably in a bunch of different exchanges, but it is the fact that tracks the dollar. So that's the key thing I like to point out when people poo poo and they talk, talk about dollar de dollar de dollarization and the dollar is going to fail. And like, okay, where are you going to go? You can get the yuan. You better talk to Mr. Z because that's an autocratic led for a country that doesn't have deep markets. But you can talk to Mr. Putin. There, it's there's no market that even compares to the dollar. If you're going to replace the dollar, you have to have something to replace it with. And there's no other currency that's even close. And here's one example of the most rapidly advancing new technology in the planet, cryptos, digitalization, blockchain. And what's the number one traded asset in that new um, technology? Right there, the dollar. So then you look at a bunch of others. There's some, there's US dollar coin, there's Binance USD, there's true USD. This is just one. There's a dozen one of these. But it's also a fact I like to point out that a lot of people don't notice is the trends are what matters. And you have to extrapolate is that going to end? So this is something the U.S. government picked up for a little while until Ben Bank of Freeman and SBX collapsed. But when you're the U.S. government, why would you mess up a technology that wants your dollars in space land? They're just going through some nuances right now. I don't know. They'll work it out. Yes, sir. Um, uh, uh, 20, 20 years ago. 
uh, the CEO of Baxter, he teaches the classes at the Kellogg School of Business. And then he had a good chart that showed the uh, mortgage and the correlation of the, uh, you know, the interest rate. Because, you know, supposedly it was right according to him, and, you know, the, you know, was coming out of the crash. The, you know, 2008, the house of crash. So, right now, you know, some circles, some people say, oh, there's a cloud of housing. So, right now, because of the increase, it's very high compared to what we had before, because it was close to zero. And then the housing market uh, is going down. I mean, the so people, they're going to start buying this. And, you know, it takes six months, according to Powell, to, to see the result. But I, I, I want to be ahead of that to see if I can probably save some money and buy me some uh, nice real estate again. So my view, as I show you here, that the housing correction has just started, the price of homes. Now, this is national. Miami local is different. Yeah. It's obviously going to be different, but yeah, we different because so typically Florida has a high beta to the rest of the country. If the rest <clears> of the country is 10%, <throat> Miami and, and, and Florida is moving 20%. Same on the downside, but there's a little different. Why am I here? Left for New York, part of the reason because of a better work environment, and it's the tax, the power of the tax. I get zero taxes here, state taxes. It's, it's a shock, um, but the world's coming here. Um, so this is what I show you on a national basis. I can show you. The housing market correction has just started from the highest level ever on a year-over-year -year basis. That's national. National. So local, that's your trade. So they get like the 100 top markets or? Um, no, this measures, so the case show is 20 top cities, FH. Um, case show. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's one of them. So here's, I show um, S&P CoreLogic case show, 10 city. It's a 10 top cities. I'm pretty sure it includes Miami. The point is, it's rolled over. It's not, it's not a, a remember before here we had a, a rollover top yeah. during the great financial crisis. The Fed started easing in September 2007, housing peaked in 2006. That's part of the reason they peaked. Here it's dropping fast. It's a V top and the Fed's still tight. That's why my macro is very bearish. The white one just, and that's liquidity. That is money supply. So they up we're still that's the key thing is I don't think there's going to be a, so typically the way it works is I don't think there's going to be a bottom in this stock market in this recession in housing prices until we have a long and variable lag from a significant period of Fed easy typically markets go down we throw a lot of money at it they keep going down and eventually they go back up here's the problem markets are going down and they're still taking the money away so I, I strike my nickname's Mick Loom. I don't like that name, but I have to point out facts. That's why I started out. These are facts. You can draw your own conclusions. I've drawn mine. And that's why I start out with these facts are important. Like I said, this money spike, it didn't matter. I mean, I used to be trading and run money. We didn't really care about money spike. It never mattered when I see it's here, when it's just fluctuating up and down, you know, a few percent. 20, but when it goes up 26% to that peak, and then it drops from that peak at the greatest pace ever. It's negative 4%, negative 5 and an updated sky. It's, I mean, money supply is leading the system. Now we have banks, credit contraction. It's harder to get a loan. Interest rates a year and a half ago were 3%. Now they're 6 and change. To not expect a severe recession in environment, I think it's illogical. But of course, the year we forget So I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's like I said, it's going to be a long and variable lag from throwing about, uh, liquidity at the system. And that's why I point out this has even this is comparable to the 1929. It wasn't like I would say the Great Depression because that was a crash. Stocks haven't crashed, which is wonderful. Um, they still could, but the crash is what started it. I mean, what's once you pull that wealth effect, once you make people feel poor, everything shuts down, and that's trickling down. So everybody's hearing about layoffs. At least in, you hear about layoffs, and you hear on your neighbor that you. Gets a layoff, you know you're going to cut back in your supply. All of the uh, all the stairs, I just remember the Rory point. Yeah, so that's that's so important. I'm glad. What's your name? Sir? Jorge. Jorge. So I'm glad you mentioned that. That's what I show here. What was the foundation? As I said, and I've started this. This is to me is a key thing to remember. Is 
Never forget from where you came from. What started the foundation, like our backgrounds, a lot of first generation immigrants, it's a country of immigrants in this country, particularly in Miami. So what started the, the, the roaring 20s? A significant recession. Jim Grant wrote a whole book about it. And that's what I show you here. That's why I'm glad you mentioned that. That's what we have now. See this orange line? Stock market took off in 29, but it had a really hard time in right around the end of World War II, 18, 19, 18 to about 1921. It was a significant recession in country in this country. Like I said, Jim Grant wrote a whole book about it. That was the foundation for market go up. It just got too high. What's the foundation for the market go up now? Is this the foundation for markets to go up? No, that's my point. It's the simple lessons of mean reversion. The risk is markets just go back to a lower plateau. But to go up in that environment would be very, I'm not saying it can't, but what drove this pump in, stock, in US stocks versus the rest of the world. So look at this. I worked for a Japanese company in 1990. The Japanese, the Nikkei index is still below that peak from 1990. So anybody in Japan basically been long the stock market still lower than from 30 years ago. The Euro, Euro stocks index, everybody in Europe, the Euro stocks index is below the peak from 2000. I mean, it's a whole continent of Europe. So anybody's been long the equity market, that does include dividends. So dividends is not making any money. But in this country, we've had this massive wealth creation for the boomers. And what are boomers doing? Cashing in. If they're smart, they're buying two year notes, T bills, real estate, income producing property, and well, getting out of the stock market. So to me, this is a great exodus. And if it doesn't go down, it'd be wonderful. But to go for this line to go up with the Fed tightening into recession would be quite unusual. Mike, we have a question from our audience. Awesome. So this one comes to us from Nalish Modi. Great question. What are Mike's views on emerging markets with the recession approaching? Uh, I have a great colleague, Damian Sassauer, who's um, um, astute on that. And I think this is going to be an issue when the world's most significant economy tilts into a recession. The U.S. Everybody suffers. The whole rest of the world. We catch a cold. The rest of the world, um, you know, U.S. sneezes. The rest of the world catches a cold. So I think they might outperform the U.S. Max, but um, this is where I, I I'm worried about everything else going down. So the key thing, number one, emerging markets, China, right? Um, significant emerging market needs. Really speaking from a commodity standpoint, the, the the consensus is China demand will pick up commodities, will pick up the global economy, and everything will be fine. Well, it's not happening. And I like to point out it's happening a little bit, but I like to point out if the U.S. catches a, a sneeze, China's going to um, get a severe cold. And that's already starting to happen in some ways. So um, I'm quite bearish on Chinese prospects, partly because they're no longer China anymore. China's one person, President Xi. Completely autocratic rule. I see it from my colleagues. I hear it from my colleagues' idea. I hear it in the markets. There's very no free markets, no price discovery, no open discourse. Um, so to me, that's not Soviet Union for that didn't work. Thank you. We've got time for maybe a few more. I'm sorry. Keep showing me those charts. You're making ah, well, So these charts are on the Bloomberg terminal. Obviously, I publish um, cliff note versions on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And I always like to show my charts. Um, so but, you have yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. Just look at Mike McGlone Bloomberg. And on Twitter, Mike McGlone um, 11. So this is one thing I enjoy publishing and I enjoy pointing out to President um, Atlantic Fed um, Governor David Altag was, did you know that the producer price index is dropping at the fastest pace in history? So that's kind of more of a leading index. What, what the Fed watches are indices called the employment cost index and the personal consumption, consumption expenditures. They're very much lagging. And my job as a strategist is to not look in the rear view mirror, but look forward. Um, and his quote was, like I said earlier, this, people at the Fed agree with me, the Fed's gone too far, but I look at that when I can say have 75 years of data and point out that prices are dropping at the fastest pace ever, that's probably something significant. Again, that's a fact, it's never happened before. 
Take your own opinion from that. The question I ask is what stops it? Typically, as we discussed earlier, you need a lot of liquidity. I have a question. Yes, sir. So my professor was telling me that um okay, he that he saw that you called the the bottom of Bitcoin. Why is Bitcoin going low again? Like what how, how so why why is it happening that it's going up again? So the way I see Bitcoin in the macro big picture, it's just a matter of time it gets to hundred thousand. Now that's just one key level, but people have been pointing that out. Um, as I point out, diminishing supply, increasing demand and adoption. But in the shorter term, it's only been around 14 years. I mean, it's still very, let's see if I can get that chart. It's still a very speculative asset. Here's the chart, it goes up over time. So when it got down to 15, lows around 15, it was just clearly, the term we like to use is oversold. Have you heard that term? When you're trading, it's just too cheap. And there's always, there's gazillions of ways to measure that. Okay, just got too cheap around 15. I pointed out it was the cheapest ever versus like a hundred week moving average. And there's so many little nuances you can use, but now it's pop, pop, pop back up. And it faces to me overall, I think it's going to go up over time. But I think the problem is it faces the ebbing tide. So this, it was a say, I think from Warren Buffett. When the tide goes out, you can find out, you see who's wearing clothes. I'm afraid that we're gonna see this recession decline in the stock market, most risk assets. And Bitcoin is one of the and cryptos among the riskiest assets. So I think it's going to pressure lower, but Bitcoin is the least risky crypto. And I think it's going to transition at some point, maybe I think it's starting now. It's just not going to be easy. Transition to becoming this massive spectacle of digital assets. People want to buy it and go higher. And tra trades more like the stock market to trade more like a risk off asset like gold and treasury bonds. It's that transition. We're probably in it right now. But I've got what to me to really get out that next really bullish indication on Bitcoin, if I can pop this up here, is to have uh good, we can see that is to have I didn't go to show you see it on that screen, right? Let's see if we can get over here. Right. Is to have um we see more of what's happening. You see, this is a the crypto screen. You see more of the stock market going down and Bitcoin going up. Now I showed you in that, that chart, banks going down and Bitcoin going up. That's a time, it's transitioning. But you see it right now, 29,000. And um, and stock, and let's just do S&P 500, S&P 500. This is the number one measure of risk on the planet, right here, S&P 500 at, four thousand. is showing that like there we go. It's just stuck there. 4,100, S&P 500. Just yeah. fluctuating. So I think it's going to go down to 3,000. 3,000? Yeah. Miss. I could give you reasons why we don't have much time left today. But to me, if and when that happens, I got to see how that works out. So you never know exactly. But right now, it's showing significant divergent strength. The key thing I wanted to point you out, point out earlier is this chart here shows what I'm kind of watching right now. It's Bitcoin's bumping up against that 30,000 level it's holding. Ethereum's bumping up against 2,000, it's holding, but it's doing it in an environment where the stock market's stable. You want to see that divergence straight when the stock market's going down. That's what I'm looking for. And stock market's still just hanging out. It's just doing yeah, nothing. Like, like, yeah. Doing nothing. Yeah. I think we're at the end of our time, but maybe we have time for one more question. Uh, I'm just checking the one that you did uh, three days ago. It said 3,000, uh, West Texas, fruit, $40. How did you arrive in forty dollars at the south if they just got a million barrels? Every time the Saudi cuts, I can dig into that later. So it's, it's it's in that the uh, read it, it's in there. I'll show you how. The um I can show I published on that starting two, three, four years ago. I published on it every couple months when I think it's sort of when the Saudis cut supply prices go down. Why? Because they're cutting supply doesn't hurt us. <laughs> the US exports crude it hurts China. It hurts emerging markets. It hurts anybody they export to. I mean, we, we're not a major customer of Saudi Arabia. That's what's changing the world. But the history of cuts from Saudi Arabia is they almost always cut when markets are in a severe downtrend. Why? Because they see what's happening. They, they see what I showed you um, in this chart here, which is showing. They see these things that I'm pointing out here. Crude oil is going down, but they see what the Fed's doing. Crude oil, biggest high ever. It's this key thing that they see the Fed's tightening and push markets lower. Uh, did I have another crude oil chart? No, this, we'll just use this main one. 
but they see the problems. Their job, their cartel, right? Their job is to help support prices. But the key fact is there may be 30% of global supply now. 10 years ago, when the US was the largest importer, they were 40% of global supply. See that trend? Less, and set, less significant than every day, buy an EV and say, sorry, we don't need you anymore. But they see what's happening. They're doing the prudent thing for a cartel, the boy prices. Now, I just point out, I wrote, and the day that happened, they cut, they cut last year, October, they cut 2 million barrels. And then just, it was in March, they cut another million barrels. And get what, what was the price of crude oil when they cut 2 million? About 100. Was it now? When they cut recently, it popped up to 83. Was it now? 75? See the trend? They're fighting the bear market. Commodities are in a bear market. I'll end with this. The thing I think to end with is natural gas. In this country, natural gas is the number one measure for heat, electricity, and fertilizer. We create more natural gas because of rapid advancing technology in Pennsylvania than most every other countries together. And New York State still closed to natural gas drilling. Natural gas has dropped to the same price as it first started trading in 1990. There's some people in this room weren't even born then. So that is significant deflation on the back of rapidly advancing technology. And it's up for the US to keep exploiting that. So to me, that's, that's the deflation. Saudi Arabia is fighting that. We're also the largest exporter now of like liquefied natural gas. We do more than Qatar does. Qatar used to be the biggest. The U.S. is now an energy exporting machine, agriculture exporting machine. We weren't that way 10, 20 years ago. So that's part of the reason Saudis are fighting that. They're fighting, they're fighting a fair market. But I like the part that you said about the fertilizer because before uh, we had to bring it to Europe to go that one cycle. So I never thought about that. So that's good. Yep, so it's good to be in America. Thanks, Max. Guys, uh, nice little round of applause. Thank you. A little gift, a little brand NBC. Yeah, thanks for your Thank you, as always. Thanks for having me. And thank you for your great questions, guys. At home, thank you. Send us an email if you'd like a recording or check out our MVC BIT Center YouTube. Have a great day, everybody. Bye bye.